And yeah, hi and welcome to this talk on, as you maybe read, be able to read, Cloud Native Java for this decade, decade with Quarkus. So I'm very happy to be here, also to be here in person again, has been a while in Malmö, and to be able to talk about uh, modern Java with Quarkus. And especially this session will be um, a hopefully fun live coding session. So this is one of the few only slides and I will do most of it live so everything can go wrong. Um, and also, I was told I'm the last person here in the room, so um, you know that you should never say this to me because uh, you know my my flight is tomorrow evening, so I have time and I can talk about this topic for hours. So just you know, if you want to leave at some point. And yes, about myself, um, my name is Sebastian. Um, there is a typo on this slide, uh, which I did on purpose. So usually my name is uh, Sebastian, the um, international spelling, but on my badge it says um, Sebastian, like the French, because, um, well, Emily is French, so that's, I guess, now I'm this Sebastian here, so I changed the slide. Um, I do a lot of stuff with Java, so I'm, well, a self-employed Java consultant, workshop trainer, whatever uh, you call it. I help um, companies and my clients with all kinds of enterprise uh, Java and, and, well, enterprise uh, things. Uh, I have a few Java titles, as you can see here, but just in general, I'm very interested in this uh, Java stuff and enterprise stuff. And we hopefully will see some funny enterprise and Quarkus coding. So about this Quarkus technology, who of you, I'm curious, has tried out Quarkus before? Hands up. Okay, well, not too many, but a few. Who of you is using something like Spring? Spring developers. Okay, most of you, I guess. Um, any other Java EE, Jakarta EE, Microprofile? Okay, so mo Micronaut, yes, cool. Okay, so mostly Spring. Then I hope I can convince you why Quarkus is a cool technology as well. And basically, I just want to get right into it. We talk a little bit about cloud native, but mostly we just talk about this enterprise uh, Java thing and a lot about developer well, productivity and the developer experience, which is really, really nice. So if you look at the website, Quarkus.io, it says something about supersonic subatomic Java. And it also says something about Kubernetes native Java, containerized. If we scroll down, we see a little bit about um, performance, memory um, consumption, footprint, and things like that. So it, well, it promises to do a lot of stuff, especially on container-based runtimes, um, which is not something that I mainly want to focus on, but it's a very interesting thing indeed. And let's get right into it. So this is... Um, a Quarkus just playground fun project, um, but not just for fun. I also do some serious stuff there, like we have, we'll see some perf uh, per some persistence and things like that. Um, some testing, of course, which is a Quarkus uh, project which uses a actually not super uh, latest Java, but a fairly latest Java. Any any of you use more than Java eight, like you know a nine onwards? Okay, very good, at least you know, and this Quarkus version. And this is just a very basic sort of hello world um, thing that does talk about coffee because I love coffee here. So this is just a very basic hello world response. If you know about Spring, this is very similar to a Spring REST controller. And in general, just this developer experience is very similar to what you know about from Spring, right? So you have some Java classes and you annotate them with some annotations. That's basically it, like this declarative um, model of coding. And then we inject some other, it's called Bean, some application scope Bean that is uh, the coffee shop here. And mainly it just says coffee. So basically, let's run this and try this out. If I run this with, with Maven, I just Maven package something together here, which will create a jar very similar to Spring Boot, you know, runnable jar. But this is already interesting what will happen here, which we will see. So it runs, well, fairly quickly. I mean, fair enough, this laptop is now five years old or so. Um, but it will create something under Targus, Quarkus app, and then this Quarkus run jar. And what it now does, it starts up actually pretty quickly. Like, let's read, oh God, that should be black or something readable. It says like uh, less than one second, uh, point zero, uh, point 0.9 seconds, which first of all is really good. But what does that do? I mean, well, as you can probably expect now, this starts up my um, application, so I can say, well, curl localhost 8080 coffee, and it says coffee. Okay, so fair enough. 
uh, this has some HTTP response. But the interesting thing, and especially the difference to, to Spring and to some other enterprise um, Java runtime, is the following, that you say, what did this Maven thing do? Well, it not only compiles my classes and runs the unit tests and things like that, it also runs what is called um, the Quark is Maven plugin, which is actually where this um, magic happens. So what is different in Quark is? Well, if you know how enterprise Java runtimes usually work is, they start up your application, your server, whatever, and then they start searching, right? They search uh, for your code in your classes for all of these annotations. They're trying to build up some sort of meta model and seeing, okay, this is a Spring REST controller, this is a CDI application scope bean, this is something else. And then you build up your application of some sorts, which we know takes a while. In the best case, just a few seconds. In the worst case, I don't know, half an hour or whatever, how long your application needs to start up. Quarkus does this differently. Quarkus does this at build time. So while your, um, your project is building, it already does all of this magic. And to be more precise, it gets rid of all of this indirection, all of these um, um, uh, direction, all of these um, uh, dependency inversion. So that is already well, in <laughs> inverted, basically. That's all resolved. And what you end up with is just direct code, like direct code invocations, as if you wrote everything from scratch, you know, like an HTTP server or something from scratch, which, of course, in any way, is a huge, huge, huge improvement in performance, in memory consumption, because all of that reflection, all of that magic is gone at runtime, which is good. So while it comes from the premise that, especially in a containerized world, we don't really change at runtime what we build there. We basically build it once, and then it just runs, right? And it starts up. And that is the biggest difference. And that has a lot of, I would say, positive implications. Um, nowadays, the compilation of that stuff is pretty fast. So with this, it took like, well, two seconds. So it's just not too bad. Actually, that's only because of the slow setup. Usually, it's like less than one second, like this whole magic. And then, as we see, if I actually want to start up my application, that just runs in, you know, less than a second. So now it's up and running. And then, as you can see, I can access it. So that's already, you know, quite, quite interesting. And that's mainly the, the biggest difference to traditional enterprise runtimes. But if you tried out Quarkus, then you probably, Quarkus, if I can type, know about this, the Quark is dev mode, which is probably what made it the most kind of like famous in the beginning. What is that? That is also a Maven plugin only for development that already has the connection to your code. So it looks into my code, it does a bunch of stuff, and then it is also up and running, my application, so I can access it. But also, I can change things, and this works extremely well, surprisingly well. So for example, if I say coffee, and say coffee exclamation mark, and then after very short reloads, let me do this like this, get rid of this command, command line, it says coffee exclamation mark. And what it did under the hood, it really quickly, it's stupid that this is gray, I hope you can read, 0.4 seconds, like 400 milliseconds, restarted the whole thing. It looks into your code, it looks at the class, uh, class changes, it detects, uh, detects which uh, type of changes you have here, and then very, very quickly you get this change, which is super cool. Um, so you say coffee, you know, you change this to exclamation mark, and then you can do this again and see, then it says coffee. And if the question is coffee, then the answer, of course, is yes. So that works quite nicely. But also, you know, it works really nicely with some other sorts of things. So for example, you can say, well, what if you would like to debug something, you know, if you don't know what's going on? Well, easy, you can actually just say, um, I would like to set a breakpoint in my IDE, and then I connect to local, oh, it's too small, localhost 5005, which is the default remote uh, JVM debug port, so nothing special, just, you know, connect this with your IDE or your tooling. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna invoke this, and now the breakpoint is captured, and you can, okay, here, sorry, it's boring, there's no variable I cannot inspect, but you know, you get the point. Now my breakpoint is caught here, and I could inspect something what's going on and step through, which is really handy. So just, you know, the development experience of setting this up is very, very nice, because I don't, you know, it doesn't make me wait. And we should not underestimate, let me get out of here, F9, uh, how important that is, why? Because we are human beings and we get bored and we get distracted just by ourselves. Um, actually, yesterday or the day before, there was a, a session, very interesting session about mindfulness and, and things like that. And we are human beings. So what happens usually? 
usually what happens, you know, we code something and then we're done and then we um, compile and start up our server, right? There is this meme about this comic when two developers are fighting with some uh, swords, you know, and having fun and the manager says, hey, what are you doing? Oh, sorry, the code is compiling. Okay, go ahead, you know, have fun. So typically we need to wait. But we really shouldn't wait. And this is really something that's, that's very important. So I, I also talk um, about the topic of developer productivity. I do workshops on that topic and helping um, developers. This is a really important topic. Why? Let's imagine. If I would need to wait, right? So if I would say, okay, this didn't work, what is the alternative? The alternative is to say I need to recompile the project and rerun it, which in this case is really fast. It's like in total maybe five seconds or 10 seconds, but it's still, it's too slow. Why? Because we get distracted. And we know this, right? So if we say um, you need to do something that takes one second, right? So you go, you invoke now, and then it's like, okay, now it's done, right? So. I'm going to wait, 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 now it's done. So it's kind of good enough. That's one second, right? But if we increase this, if we say, you know, now it's two seconds, um, okay, now it's done, right? So you can do this again. I'm waiting, 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 okay, now it's done. And this gets boring quite quickly. And typically, and this threshold is actually at two or three seconds, depending on how impatient you, you are. So I'm a millennial, and my generation is said to be super impatient. And I would say that's not only a negative thing, but you can really take this and say, okay, can I improve something here? And that is very typical for us humans. If we say, well, something makes me wait for 10 seconds, then you're like, dup, 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 dup. oh yeah, I haven't checked social media in a while, and let me see what's new on Twitter, and, you know, and then your attention is gone. And then it might even finish and you don't even see it because now you're elsewhere. And this is really, really crucial. And then also you're distracted, you forget about all of the corner cases that you just thought of, and this is where bugs come in, because then you forget about them again. So really don't make me wait while you're coding, while your hands are on the keyboard, don't distract me, like just make it quick. And this is not only true for just executing these things and testing them manually, but obviously also for, well, actual tests, like especially unit tests and things like that. So I have some super, super boring unit tests here. Um, I also have some sort of system or acceptance tests that actually go against the HTTP API, which is also really important. Okay, so this is just as, a, as an example, what does this do? Well, it invokes this method and asserts something. And if I run this in my IDE, that's already some interesting thing. Sorry, it's too small, but you can guess it. It says expected coffee question mark and um, is equal to coffee without question mark, and that's, of course, failing. Okay, so what is this? Here, I can read it to you, it's too small. It says 100 millisecond about the test result. So JUnit is really, really fast, but we must not forget also the actual turnaround time. So I'm pressing the key now of running it, and now I get the result, right? So the IDE takes like two or three seconds to just initialize the whole thing and then it runs it. Which also is a really nice feature since Quarkus 2 um, that is called continuous testing. So if I activate the testing output with O, it actually has a very nice way of running my tests. I can press R and now it runs these tests. And here you see the result. And I can run them again and I can run them, you see this blinking, it's, it's that fast, it says like 33 milliseconds, because what, it, uh, what this does, it already has the test compiled and it's just executing it. It's just calling the method, and of course that's super fast. For me that's nice, because I can really um, say, okay, change this to an exclamation mark, and you saw I couldn't even switch the window so fast, it was already green. It says was run in 10 milliseconds, now it's all green again, right? So I break it again, I say, okay, coffee without, and now it's failing again already, it's like instant which actually should be the case, right? If we think about it, it's, it's not doing magic, it's just a Java method invocation. It, it could be that fast, and actually it should be. And this is a big, big, big problem I see in all sorts of test environment where we say, okay, um, what does the test environment look like? And in Spring, quite typically, you have some sort of Spring context tests, right? In Java Enterprise, they exist as well. We had Achillean. In Quarkus, there's also Quarkus test, which I usually don't use in my workshops, like on, for this reason. Uh, what it does, that it, it basically says, well, in your tests, you can sort of tangle the test environment um, with the test lifecycle. So the lifecycle of the test environment with the lifecycle of the test, which I say is usually a bad idea because it makes you wait. 
So then you start your test and the tester says, oh, does your application run? No, I'm going to start it up for you, you know, which is very nice, but it takes time, as you usually, you know, know. So how long does your testing build take for overall, you know, probably more than one minute, more than two minutes or whatever have you. And this is bad because it makes us wait. So that being said, I have a smoke integration test, the reason why this is called IT for integration test, that's a Maven convention. You probably know about this fail-safe integration test thing. If you run your Maven build, it does not execute these per default, which is what I want. What is the difference here? This already runs against your actual system. This will connect to your HTTP endpoint. And I just wrote a very basic class here. This is sort of part of my testing thing here that uses, that's like a REST template in the Spring world. That's an HTTP client, connects against my local host 8080 or some system configuration and says, okay, you know, invoke this. So what that here does is, let me execute this. It goes against the HTTP um, API and here actually now you get the same error. It asks it what is the response of this method or of this resource slash coffee, HTTP 200 okay, and it of course, expect that it's coffee question mark, which I now fixed. Let me run it again. Yeah, you see the IDE is a little bit slower. <laughs> now it's green. So same story. It actually is nice that it runs that quickly because it just connects against something that is already running. Does this work with this um, Quarkus thing as well? Well, originally, no. Why? Because here you see it only runs this unit test, the coffee shop test class. Why? Because per default, it uses the same Maven conventions, which I think makes sense, uh, that Maven does. But you can uh, change this with dash the Quarkus. Oh God, Quarkus dot test dot, uh, I think, exclude pattern. So it has an exclude pattern. Oh God, pattern that excludes the ITs per default, which is the same like, uh, so Maven Surefire configuration, if you have a look at that, does the same thing. If you set this to an empty string, it doesn't exclude anything, so it runs all of the tests. Same like, you know, Maven. So then one is that up, uh, once that is up and running, I also rerun the tests again with R, and then it says, okay, here it runs the same coffee smoke IT and the coffee shop tests. Now it runs the two tests that I have and then says, okay, rerun then in almost a second. Second time it's faster, 40 milliseconds, 42 milliseconds, again, 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 and things like that. So I can rerun my integration test here as well. So this does the HTTP connection. That does that as well. Quite interesting. And for me, very helpful. So what does that mean? Well, that means if I change something in my code, if I say, okay, change this to, you know, coffee exclamation mark. What do I typically do? Well, I switch the window and then it already says, okay, now first of all, your unit test is failing because you switched something. Okay, my unit test is failing. Then I go to my unit test and say, okay, please fix this to the exclamation mark. And then it says, okay, run this again. Okay, now my IT is failing, coffee exclamation mark. Okay, now I go to my IT. And now you see what is happening. Now, it, now it's green. I don't, I don't even have the time to grab for my coffee, you know, and take a sip because it's just, it doesn't make me wait. It's just instant, which should be the case while we're developing. Okay. So that's quite fun for the developers. But um, now let's do one more thing. I want to include a little bit more fun coding. So I want to include some persi persistence because persistence is always also fun. It does things differently. And what I can do, we can all uh, live code this now, which is really cool. I can include the um, artifact for that. So if you have a look at the Quarkus website, you can start coding. It's very much like the start spring IO. There is code.quarkus.io. And then it has tells you all the dependencies that you need to add depending on what you want to do. And I now use this Hibernate and uh, Postgres JDBC for just doing some persistent stuff. So let's do some persistent stuff. What do we have here? I have a second um, resource, REST resource, that says I can have some coffees. And the coffees here, that's under slash coffees, plural. And I can get some coffees, you know, that are returned here in some way. And I can also create a coffee. I can, for example, say create some coffee with some specific type. So let's do this. If you checked out down in the conference, there is a nice coffee shop with some uh, two nice guys that make some delicious coffee for you. So unfortunately, you have to pay, but I think it's worth it. So if you order some coffee, then, you know, you can 
have something like an orders here. What does this mean? I have coffees here, get coffees, which is an empty JSON array, so there's no coffee in the system. So this is a very basic um, sort of API. If I say I would like to create a coffee, then what I do, an HTTP post some JSON to this endpoint, right? And as we've seen, there is some type. So, you know, downstairs in the hall, you can also say, I would like to have some espresso, some filter coffee, which is really nice and recommend, um, or some latte or something like that. So let's say we would like to order some espresso. It tells you 201 created. Okay, there is a location here, and now it should be in the system. Okay, no, it's not. So let's see. I told you live coding, everything can go wrong. There is some exception here, which is nicely um, returned here as well. Um, now value for templates parameter ID, no, this should be, so let's have a look what's going on here, I actually didn't, didn't prepare that, it shouldn't be a um, juggling illegal argument exception, no value for template parameter ID, so this should be here, but I'm not there, I should be in the get all coffees, right, slash coffees, and then um, have this, so let's see. No, it does not. So um, let's see what's going on here. Get uh, all coffees. Um, probably I have this here. Is that there? Yes, that's there. Ah, yeah, I see. There is this get coffee and then this uh, path ID. Okay, let's see what is there. Get coffee ID. I changed this before, so this might be might be an issue here. Otherwise, what I can do, I just quickly uh, restart that and then see what's what's going on. Maybe I can I have uh, some issues, other issues with my code. So, you know, when I do live coding and something goes wrong, I'm actually not that mad because I can always tell you, trust me, the same will happen to you. So maybe I can show some, <laughs> some things how to quickly find this. Um, so let's see. I now try to run this in the other way. Maybe I overlooked something. Quarkus app, Quarkus run my application. And then I say, okay, get all the coffees here. And now trying to um, post some coffee again. And get this, okay, arrow stack trace. So here it says the same thing. Let me just one second, I need to make this small, otherwise I cannot read. So um, no value for template uh, parameter, replace parameter. Oh, yes, in the URI. So I think this was just, this wasn't set when I created my uh, my coffee because I had to change the code again. I think when I say add coffee, I'm not sure if it says, oh yeah, it didn't set the coffee ID. I actually want to, I don't want to talk about this too much because I'm gonna change this in a second to, um, to a proper persistent example. So I just set to, uh, forgot to set something that then would, would be null. So which is what I changed before, but obviously I didn't have coffee in the morning when I did change this. So let's see this once that is up and running. Then I can create some coffee, and then I see the coffee in the system. Okay, perfect. So now that's in the system. I ordered some espresso. It has some link and blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's boring because that stores everything in memory. And in memory is easy but boring. So what does that have? This coffee shop has a hash map, a concurrent hash map, where everything is stored. That's an application scoped, in other words, a singleton. So it works, but of course everything is gone once I restart my application. So let's change the coffee a little bit. The coffee, very easy, is just you know this sort of pojo, more or less. I do these here public, which is kind of what uh, most uh, Quarkus folks tell you for Panache, this Hibernate OAM. And now what we can do, and that's really cool, we can keep the Quarkus dev mode running, and I just changed something. Okay, let's do this. If you are in the JPA spring world, you know what this looks like. If I want to do a JPA entity, that's at entity, right? So that's gonna be a coffee, and I can say at table definition, for example, some table name coffees, right, for my database. And then what I need to do, well, you know this, if I have an entity, I need some ID, right? That's gonna be this field here. That's gonna be a generated value. And the string here, it's gonna be there as well. We can make this basic option of false or whatever. So that's it. Now it's an entity. Very easy, right? Well, as you know, usually the configuration and the stuff around, that's the thing that is not that easy. So I would need some uh, database. I would need to configure the database, have some init script or whatever have you. The nice thing is Quark is out of the box, comes with something that is called dev services. So this is actually active because I didn't um, 
configure something, and it says dev services for default data source started. So what does that mean? Well, I'm telling Quarkus, hey, by the way, I would like to have this extension for JDBC Postgres, but I didn't configure a database. So if I have a look at my application properties, it's empty. What does it do, Quarkus? It says, well, you would like to have a database. You don't have one, so I started up one for you. So quite nicely, and it uses this test containers out of, uh, under the hood, it did start, you just saw this two minutes ago, I didn't prepare this up front, it did start a Postgres database for me and configured it using test containers. So actually I can say, I'm going to use this now in my code. And the nice thing is, since all of that is just dynamically, it's still up and running, I can do this and I can change my application while it's running and I can keep coding. Okay, so how does this work? I can say in my coffee shop, let's delete some code first. I get rid of this hash map. I don't need it anymore. So I'm going to delete it here and here and here and say, OK, what do I do instead? Well, what do you do typically in the enterprise world? You use an ent entity manager or in the spring world, you typically have something like spring data JPA, right? Some nice pattern to access this. In Quarkus Panache, there's something similar, which I think is a very nice pattern. Also has this repository pattern. Um, that, well, you can call, for example, coffee repository that has some types that actually are very similar to Spring Data um, JPA repositories. I can say this should be an application scoped uh, bean that implements Panache repository. So a Panache repository uh, has a type for, you know, coffee. So this will be a repository for my, you know, coffee. That's already enough. Well, it would be enough if the coffee has a long ID, which it doesn't. Otherwise, I can say extend panache uh, or implement panache repository base for a long type or a UUI, I don't see anything, UUID type that then says, okay, this you know should be an entity and the ID type that I define. And out of the box, that's all that you have to do. I don't have to implement here anything. I can, but I don't have to and then I can already use this type, and it comes with a lot of standard methods out of the box, which are more convenient than what your entity manager would do, as you probably know. So I can say um, repository, inject this here, and then very simple, I can say repository.findById. It knows about the type, so UUID matches, and that's it. That will, under the hood, use this entity manager, blah, 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 blah. For the get coffees, that's even nicer. It has different types. I could say find or list and list, and I could also say stream, you know, and list as the name says, already has this list type, so that's it. I don't need to say, okay, entity manager named query, blah, 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 and result type and things like that. I can just say list all because it's a typed parameterized type that works. Okay, add coffee. That's now more interesting. I can say, okay, this coffee will be created. The UUID will now be generated. I don't have to do this anymore. And I can say repository.persist, um, not to type the coffee. And then if I read through it and it says, okay, persist makes it actu uh, this actually a persisted entity. So then it should be that coffee.id then is populated, which we can check out. So that should actually be enough to just persist that. Okay. Who thinks this will work? Nobody. <laughs> yes. Me also neither because I, uh, I built in a small um, bug. Not a bug, but something that you typically forget. So here we get an exception again. Usually it's readable if you don't have that crazy font size. But um, here you might even know this, what is now missing. And it nicely tells you if you paid attention. So somewhere down, uh, downstairs says, Blah, 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 transaction required exception. Transaction is not active, and it nicely even tells you, consider adding add transactional to your method. Well, you probably know this. You have to make this a transactional method, so add add transactional here to this method or to the whole class where we say, okay, add, uh, add transactional. You know, restart this again. And now it seems to work. 201 created. I have one, two espressos and one latte. So now I should have three coffees in the system. So where is, where's my second list? Did I have this twice? I think so. Do this once again. Okay, there it is. So now I have these in the system. And let's check if I can actually access my, my database as well. So they should be here, 
Now this has a different port. I actually have to see how to, can I connect to this? I should be Postgres um, local host. Uppercase or smaller piece P. I always forget these uh, these things, and I think it's uppercase U for username, right? Postgres. No, that's the wrong port. Then it's uppercase P. No, it's not. Does somebody know these things by heart, or is it uh, this one? Okay. Yeah, I would. S yeah, no. Then I will try this out in a second example. But um, now you can believe me. That's in the database, but I can do a proper database in a second. Because this is quite nice that Quarkus starts this up per default, which is helpful, um, but of course, you know, you would have a proper thing. What is active in the dev mode is what is called the dev UI, and that will also show you that you have some, uh, what is called dev services available. And here it will tell you the ones that it just started up. Why? Because you added the dependency. So then it tells you this is exactly the, the Postgres database that was running and with this configuration. So that's the default configuration that was now inserted, which again is quite nice that this works. So you've seen I can do things, I can create that. But now let's change this. I can uh, define my own database, which is typically what you want also for local um, development. So typically I have something like that. I have my Postgres uh, database that then says, okay, run this in a typical Docker localhost or whatever setup, right? And then I would start up my own database where I have typically something like either a shell script for it or some Docker run or some Docker compose or some Kubernetes local, whatever you want to do, right? And then I say, okay, run this, which makes a lot of sense to do it in this way. Why? Because I can easily add some script with some uh, SQL in it and things like that. Okay, so what I do, I stop the whole thing again. And then I say, please run my database. And now this test containers will be gone in a second. This is just like a you know, kill switch process. Um, and now my database, the one I defined that I called coffee shop DB, now that's up and running. I just started this. And now if I start, now it's clean. Now it's only this container running. Now if I start my Quarkus project again, um, Quarkus dev, what it does, now it detects the configuration. It does not start up my dev UI because it's now, as my dev UI it does start up, but not the dev services because it's uh, already running. So that's a little bit faster. And then I can say, okay, now do the following that have my uh, post, <laughs> not Postgres, post, yes. One, two, three. And see that now my coffee is there and I have my coffees in the system again, and now I should be able to connect to my Postgres because I, I don't know who came up with all of these Postgres parameters. They're so confusing. Do you know how to quit this thing? It's backslash Q, you know? Whoever came up with this parameter, I don't know what, because if you're trying to you know, exit, no, this doesn't, oh, it does work, okay, that's new. That's new. <laughs> it did not work before. You could not write exit. You could not write quit. You have to have this weird backslash Q. Okay, anyway. Um, and backslash D does a describe for your tables and um, describes the table of your coffees. Okay, so talking about developer experience. So basically, it created a table for you for this um, UUID and type. So if I say, okay, select from this table, it should be there, and in fact, it is. So you see, de facto, my application just created these things. And if I restart my application, it's still there. Okay, so that works, and that's quite nice. Now what I want to show you is a little bit more of the testing perspective. Why? Because for the development experience, that's really important as well, that you have some proper tests. And what I do in projects, it depends a little bit. I quite typically tell uh, folks to have a separate project that has not the connection to the production code. Why? Because you really l look at it from a, a black box perspective that you kind of connect to it like a user would. So this is a separate project that is just called system test. It does not have the connection to the um, to the production code. It's only you know plain Java. It could be any other programming language, and it has a similar you know sort of. Uh, hello world aspect to it and says, okay, connect to this and check if the coffee response is like that. And of course it's not, as we know, I can change this to a coffee exclamation mark and then, you know, I can have this here again. I can also run this in the command line is to say uh, my Quarkus playground profile system test. 
And then if I run, this is by the way how you run Maven integration test, fail safe integration test and verify. This is how you run these ITs from the command line. And then it says, okay, it runs it and everything is green, right? Where is it here? This um, fail safe thing. There we go. Okay. What I can do, which is more interesting, I can say I add a test now for create order where I say I use this coffee system now to create a coffee with some specific type, you know, like an espresso, which then should have, you know, my ID or my URI, you know, that then is being created. And then typically what you do say, you know, now this should be a functional acceptance test. You should be, I want to create a coffee as a user, so I go against the API, I use the documentation, right? And then I go against the system as well and say, okay, retrieve coffee based on some ID. So that does now very much the same what I did on a command line. I say create a new coffee, then get the ID and check if the information is correct, right? If I say coffee, I can say assert that the coffee has a certain, come on, coffee has a certain type, right? So I can say, okay, check if it's in the system correctly, if it was stored correctly in a database, right? So this is more the functional test that says use all of these things in my system. Now, the interesting thing about that is also these sort of tests have to run fast. What we were talking about before is also very important here that you get this fast feedback. Otherwise, the same problem happens that you say, I code, I code, I code, and I don't run my tests because they take so long, right? I don't want to wait for minutes, so I just, you know, I neglect them. But what you can do here, I can run them again. No, not just this, all of them. And I can say, now I get the response, which is really fast. Okay, but there's more. There is a nice hack that is actually a hack um, that I was talking about on my, on my blog. This system test project is just a plain Java project. But if you say, hey, I like the way how quickly my quark is dev mode usually runs my tests, I want this for other Java projects as well, this actually works. This is a little bit of a workaround, but you can use the quark is dev mode for non quark is projects which does the following, that you say my system test project, this one, it's just a plain Java project, you know, nothing with Quarkus, has a specific profile in which I'm adding this Quarkus thing as well, just because I can, and then I can run this Quarkus dev mode or this test mode as well, which runs as follows. If you say uh, Maven um, profile, I activate this, and then I say um, uh, Quarkus, test or quark is def, def uh, test is just a test basically. Um, I say uh, I have to do the same exclude pattern that I did before, exclude pattern to make this empty so that my IT is running. And then what I can do, and that's pretty cool, I think, and I do the same thing without the ITs what I had here before, exclude pattern. Then here you already uh, see it. I can actually rerun this and then my test is Failing. Why is it failing? Because I just restarted my, uh, <laughs> my application. Now I can read on this again, and now it's green. So now this runs my whole system test project in half a second, and I can rerun it again, rerun it again. And this, I'm not joking, this really creates my, oh God, why is this so small? This really creates my coffee orders. So if I say now coffee, um, coffees, they are now here in the system. So if I say, um, I think it's length or something like that, right? Okay, this thing can count. 10, and it's, if I say one, two, three, it should really run my system tests and they are in the system. And now if you think about it from a developer's perspective, from this uh, coding experience perspective, this is really important to have that experience to say, my hands are on the keyboard and while I'm typing, I don't want to wait, regardless if it's a production code change or a test code change or even a system test run. These things should run fast and usually that is the case. You know, for most enterprise projects, you really can come up with such a, um, you know, such a workflow. So for example, if I say now in my coffee shop, I change this from, you know, this coffee exclamation mark to co coffee question mark. I save something. I go back uh, to this one and say, okay, please run my, wait a second, output enabled. Now, run my tests, and it says, okay, test fails, because it's coffee question mark. Okay, now I go to my coffee shop test and say, change this to um, question mark, right? So I change this test. I go back and say, okay, run it again. Now my smoke test fails, my HTTP smoke test. So I go to this IT and says, okay, please now update this as well, right? 
So I run this again. Okay, now this is green. Then I run my system test and so okay, now this is failed. You know, and you get the point. It should really be that fast. So I don't even get to you know drink my coffee here because it is just it doesn't make me wait. I'm just like typing and now it's everything is green again. So this and this, and that should be I think the coding experience while we're coding. So for me, it's not much of a problem if we say we're building up our local environment. So if we have a database, if we have an external system that might run in a Docker container, Docker Compose, whatever have you, it's fine to start up these things and to wait a few seconds until everything is you know, started up. You know, I can start this up in the morning, I go to the coffee machine, I drink my coffee. But once it is started up, I don't want to wait. And that's pretty crucial, I think. Okay, so that's that. What is another cool feature in Quarkus? I don't have many minutes. Um, but two minutes should be enough to show this, is a templating feature that is called uh, Qt, like Quarkus templating engine, um, which is a very nice thing to make uh, server-side rendered HTML in Quarkus. That is supported um, if you add this dependency. And I was quite amazed, actually, in the beginning how, how well this runs. So uh, once I was trying it out in the first a case, it's really not a toy. It has been, you know, developed like a lot of things in Quarkus. You really see um, that this has been, you know, made with production mind in mind. It's not just to play around. You can really do projects with this, and people do. <laughs> so what I do here is basically it's a little bit like Spring uh, MVC web, you know, MV action based MVC, um, where I say this should be, you know, a controller for, for example, orders HTML or something like this application scoped and produce um, not JSON, but HTML. This works with JAXRS. And what I can say at get orders HTML, and then what it does, I can forward to at location orders HTML, which will be a so-called template type. And these templates per default reside under source, um, res source main resources, um, templates, that's the default, slash, and then the name of your template, orders HTML, for example. And then I say, okay, create something here, call this uh, coffee, whatever. And then says, you know, um, coffee. And this then will just be forwarded and basically, you know, emit it here. So I can say, if I have a get method, it should be get for a, um, that's then the type template. Where I say, okay, return this template and then, you know, make some um, instance. Okay, and then what you can do, you can go to your um, browser, 8080, localhost, not index HTML, but orders HTML, and then it renders it, which of course now is boring because that's just static, but let's add something dynamic. If I say I want to have my data for my orders that come, of course, for my um, coffee orders here, so I can inject my uh, coffee shop, then load the door, uh, orders from the database, uh, get coffees, I think, uh, orders or coffees or whatever, and add them here, and then I can use them in my code and say, okay, uh, for example, have, and then the syntax is as follows, that I can say for coffee in coffees, that's very well documented, so you can check out this, this syntax, is a little bit like like handlebar, so it has these these sort of things, and then we can say uh, coffee dot what do we have type or something like that, and then we typically say you know that's a ul um, li list you know and these things, so we have that, and then we say okay you know uh, that's available there, and then depending on uh, whatever we have oh yeah template exception, oh thank you, um, we can have this. So with all of our espresso and latte and things like that. So that's quite, you know, nice. And it's actually, I, I use this in production and projects. It's actually about very nice techniques. Question. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
kind of. Um, yeah. So the question is, why, why is this exciting? What is uh, what is different in Spring? Um, I'm uh, not that much developing in Spring, but I've talked to a lot of the Spring developers and asked them sp specifically about Spring Dev Tools. Is sort of like an equivalent, but they say, well, it doesn't work as well. Actually, if you work in more complex projects, you know, changing a string is always easy. But if you say, what if I have a huge hierarchy of classes and it, it, can you restart all of this? And in Quarkus, this works extremely well. You really Usually, you don't have to restart this quark as dev. Even if you add dependencies, it will automatically download them uh, in background. So this works really well. And the other thing is for if we talk now more about the cloud, about this, and this really does make a difference, especially if you have, well, actually always, especially if you have big deployments or many deployments, but it always makes a difference. Why? Because of resource consumption. So that's a big one, you know, memory footprint. And especially in the cloud world, memory consumption equals to money. You know, because the more memory you have to run in the cloud, that is directly relatable to money. I would say there's also an environmental friendly story there, because if you have, uh, if you need less resources for to run the same thing, that's of course you know good for the uh, carbon footprint as well. But I would say just the development experience. Once you really go down and you code, you can try it out yourself, and really please do. It's really fun to do. It's not maybe it's fun to watch, but it's even more fun to do it because it doesn't make you wait. It's so nice to just you know code, code, code without being distracted. Um, other than that, I mean you're sort of right. It doesn't. It hasn't had have that many differences um, to Spring. So it does you know Spring also you can do all of the typical microservices with HTTP databases and the thousands of extensions. They are there in Quarkus as well. The Quarkus ecosystem is very much supported. I mean I can say this because I, I found a few issues myself and they were fixed really really fast. So uh, this works quite nicely. Um, why you want to code with Quarkus to answer that question? Basically developing experience and turnaround times. This is really a big one. APIs, I mean, yeah, a lot of developers use Spring. Spring um, annotations are also supported, you know, with a star, with a caveat, not all of it. I mean, you cannot run a Spring project with this, but it even supports the Spring annotations, you know, this add servers, add controls, things like that. You can actually even add some Spring code, and for migration projects, this is helpful, and run them like that. Panache persistence, I think, is very much uh, very nice. Thin deployment artifact, that's another big story that now we don't have talk, uh, time to talk about, but the Docker support and especially the containerized support really makes sense. On the one hand, how much that was being built in the beginning, so thin deployment artifact might be a buzzword. On the other hand, with this resource consumption and also the amount of threats that you're running in a container. If you go down that rabbit hole, to use, to use that term, this is a very big one if you say, okay, how many threads are running in my container, resource consumption, memory, things like that. Uh, you can check this out. Templating engine, I very quickly showed, and the whole ecosystem. So I, I would say this is a very interesting uh, technology. All right, so if you uh, want to learn more, I'll be here. And, you know, I have time for, for questions and things like that. I also uh, encourage you to check out some more material. If I can uh, help you something uh, like this, I offer some, uh, some courses, some actually some uh, on-demand video courses and also some workshops that are, the next one is in December, uh, which uh, you're happy to join. Or if you want to have some company internal workshop, just contact me, I'm always open you know, to, to help other developers. As always, you can check out my code, so that's on GitHub. Um, you can also follow me on, on Twitter, actually on the Fediverse, I have the same handle, so that's, that's fine, and uh, YouTube channel, uh, things like that, so you can uh, give this a go. And just in general, you know, give it a try, try it out yourself. If I can help you um, with something like that, just feel free to you know, text me always, that's, I'm very happy to help. But just if you try it out yourself, I think you will see it's really fun. You know, just to have some hacky project and to see the development experience, it's I think just fun to do and well, fun to watch maybe. So I hope this was helpful. I hope this was entertaining for the sort of almost end of the conference. I really hope you also enjoyed your time here at Eurodev. I do have something for you. I have some stickers. Whoever wants some Quarkus stickers, they're here in the table. You can check them out. And with that, thank you very much for listening.